The following podcast contains spoilers and words such as <laughs> done and bother. Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back here to We Watched A Thing, it's Billy and I'm here as always with my great friend Toph, and how are you this week? No complaints, N- none, no complaints. That's a pretty good week. Alright, have you watched anything good this week though? Many would say we have. Yes, many would, because this week we are talking about Tarantino's Jackie Brown. Some would say the lost Tarantino film. Not really, just the semi-forgotten one. It, you can understand why this is one that I hadn't seen. I think there's a I think there's a lot of people who might say that. I mean, maybe it's the fact that it's an adaptation. I think there are plenty of people out there who would consider this the lesser Tarantino. Could be that it's the follow up to Pulp Fiction. Yes, yeah, that's true. That because after I mean the one two punch of Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. I mean, people would have been Tarantino mad. <laughs> QT crazy. (laughs) All right. Jackie Brown is a 1997 American crime film written and directed by Quentin Tarantino and starring Pam Greer in the title role. Film is an adaptation of Elmore Leonard's 1992 novel Rum Punch. It's the only feature length film that Tarantino has adapted from a previous work. And as well as Pam Greer, it stars Samuel L. Jackson, Robert Forster and Michael Keaton. And what's it about, Toph? Funnily enough, not a lot. (laughs) Come on. It's about a woman trying to get out from under the thumb of an asshole played by Sam Jackson. Succinct. I think that's fair. Yeah. I I feel like we might differ on this. So, yeah, let's see where this goes. What a mood setter. Well, this film just opens with Bobby Womax across 110th Street. Yeah. With with Greer going through the airport. Yeah. What a fucking killer opener. Yeah, it's great. And Greer is a fucking powerhouse in this movie she rocks she's so great but yeah that is that is a great opener of this film it's funny it i would say it almost sets the mood but then the next 25 30 minutes of the film she doesn't even make an appearance her first speaking line is half an hour into the film yeah for a film called jackie brown it does not mind being without the title character for yes for quite a while um yeah you get a chunk of the way into the film and it's like the film feels that she's as disposable as a lot of the people in her life feel about her. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Because uh, we spend an awful lot of time straight up with Sam Jackson. And Robert De Niro. With Jackson playing um, a right royal piece of shit. I'm going to have nightmares about that gross little beard thing. <laughs> like, oh, I think the ponytail's worse. Oh, I don't know. What I mean- There's nothing good going on. But the beard is like a ponytail on his face. <laughs> yeah, but it's got, you know, it's at least it's plaited. It's kind it's of pretty. Cool. Oh, it's pretty gross. Can you imagine kissing that, having that rubbing against your chin? Like, oh, not on board. And so Jackson, obviously, you know, he's following on from working with Tarantino in Pulp Fiction. Yep. Um, and he's on, you know, you look back at his his IMDb and he's on, an, he's on a hell of a streak at this point. I mean, he's been on a streak ever since. He's still, like, the highest grossing actor of all yeah, time. Yeah, there's a difference between that and being good. Well, that's true. That's true. Because we get to the point where Sam Jackson stops being this good and just becomes shouty Sam. Yes, this is true. Where in this film, he's comfortably sharing scenes with De Niro. Yes, and this is like this is pre Rocky and Bullwinkle De Niro. This is still kind of proper De Niro. <laughs> yes, and Jackson is on fire in this film. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure where you were going there, and I wasn't sure if you were going to disagree with me, and you still might. But for me, this is Jackson's finest hour. Like I know a lot of people will point to Pulp Fiction, and he is great in that. I think this is by far his best performance he's given. What's interesting is that he was shooting this concurrently with Sphere. So oh, interesting. When he, when he then becomes far worse straight after this film, um, well, no, I think no, we know no, why. No, I, I was, think we I know was, why. I was going to say maybe that's why his performance in Sphere is so elevated because he's he's bringing over there what he's working on here and he's bringing that same energy back. Yeah, so that absolute bucket of shit <laughs> Sphere <laughs> is, what, is what ruined his career post Jackie Brown. We've solved it. That's outrageous. You know who else is in who else is in Sphere? Sharon Stone. Great. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that's a fact. 
<laughs> also, Dustin Hoffman's there. And Dustin Hoffman, he's great in it. Yeah, he's really Queen good. Latifah. She's Queen Latifah, movie. fantastic. Queen La- Everybody loves Queen Latifah. <laughs> she gets eaten by jellyfish. It's fantastic, mate. You can't top that. Very bad film. <laughs> um, anyway, Jackie Brown. <laughs> um, well, I'll just go right out of the gate. I ended up really loving this film. And I say ended up because it did take me a while. I don't think it's a perfect film. The same way that you felt Brazil had some fat, this definitely has some fat. But I really, really loved this film. This film I watched only a matter of months ago for the second time. I hadn't seen it in a long time because I'd seen it once and was like, okay, that wasn't bad. But not bad is not what you want from Tarantino. And so then a couple of months ago, I watched it again and, and like was fully geared up. I was like, this is going to be a transformative experience. Yeah. This film is going to change for me. I'm going to absolutely love, love it. And I watched it and was like, yeah, it was pretty good. And then this time, funnily enough, I'd seen before I watched it this time, was reading a little bit about the film. And Tarantino said about this film that he thinks of it as a film that does get better and better with every watch because it's not about the plot. It's about just being with the characters. And this film is a better hang than it is a watch, if that makes sense for me. I actually did love the story. And part of my thing is I wish that Tarantino would do more adaptations because I'm sure I'm going to be alone here. And yes, I've missed half of his filmography. (laughs) But in my head, Quentin is not about story and he's never been that great at coming up with or telling stories. What he does really exceptionally well is characterization, dialogue and character development. And that's why I feel like this is a great film, because when you combine a really tight, suspenseful, good story, which I think this is, With his characterizations and dialogue, you get something really, really top notch. And I personally, I found this a really gripping watch. I cared about Jackie Brown and about her story. I cared about the side characters. I cared about the cops. I cared about De Niro and Melanie and all those scumbags. Like, I felt like this was a really, really tightly knit picture. And I do think it would get better with subsequent viewings because the reason I say I ended up liking it is for the first half hour, like we were just saying, you sit there going, what's happening? How does this, you know, where's Jackie Brown? But watching it a second time, you know how it ties together by the end. And I think it would make for a better viewing. Yeah, it's funny you say that you find the whole thing completely gripping. The the reason I liked it so much more on this watch was that I don't find it a gripping film. And when I'm really locked into it, I want more from it. But watching it this time, after like only having seen it really recently, so you don't have to be actually, your brain can be switched off from following the plot because you know what happens there and you are just hanging with the characters. I find it a far more successful film on that level. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, to me, I found it really uh, suspenseful and and tight and I loved the, the twists and turns and sure, none of them are that twisty like it's not like there are huge shocks here where you're like whoa i didn't i didn't see that coming but there are moments where you're like well that's an interesting turn for the story and i do think that it it's the way that it ties together you know like by the final half hour you understand why we've spent time with de niro and melanie which for the first half hour i'm going who are these people (laughs) so yeah for me i really loved the the storytelling and, and the way that it played out who were these people and why the first four shots of her, her feet? Yes. Quentin. Too, too many what feet. What is up? This is excessive. There is an excessive <laughs> amount of feet here. So I, because I enjoyed the film so much, I actually went and read the book, which- You read it or? Mate, we've been you over li- this. I'm not doing it again. I so you listen to it. I I read it with my but ears. That's, it's fine that you listen to it. Okay. Just, say, I, just say you listen to it. All right. I listened to it. Yeah. <laughs> And in listening to it, I, I, I read it. <laughs> yes, you, you, you took it in. Yes, I took, you took in, in the I, book. I took in the book. And it's amazing how, how almost exactly the same it is. I, I was, the, part of the reason I read it is, because, and I think I messaged you at the time when I was half hour in, I said, I bet the book will be better. Because in my head, I was like, 
I bet the book just gets straight into Jackie Brown and is really just her story. It's not. The first three, four chapters are Lewis and Odell and Melanie and Jackie Brown doesn't come in till chapter four. It's exactly right. the same. Interesting. Now, what's the character's name? It, she's she's Jackie in the book, isn't she? she? It's, yes. Is it Burke? She's Jackie Burke. That's right. right. Yes. Now, interestingly enough, did you notice in the credits that the casting director's name for this film is Jackie Brown? Indeed. Yeah. Not The film is not named after her, of course. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting, nonetheless. <laughs> and I think I read that because my assumption is that it was a nod to Foxy Brown. Well, for, that sounds it, with, right With the Pam me. Greer of it. But I actually don't think it is. Really? I think it's, I think that's just another happy coincidence. I do think that the name Jackie Brown is um, it's a cool name that rolls. It is a cool time. name, so in especially book, when Pam Greer says it. Yeah, in the book she's white, which is just about the only difference really. There's a few small differences like that. She's white, and the book is set in Florida instead of California, which is interesting because in in the film California is almost like a character. Like there's a lot of Hollywood talk and stuff, which is obviously Quinton bringing his own twist and personality through but that's virtually the only differences and the rest is there are even segments that like you think about quentin's dialogue there are segments that are literally word for word um from the book which i found really interesting i was not expecting that to be the case i reckon sticking with the cast i reckon you could go there's a there's a big chunk of american cinema at around about this time where you could go through a year and pick a great role that should have been Michael Keaton. How great is Keaton in this film? <laughs> you know, just sometimes you're watching Keaton and you just go, I don't think the standing that Michael Keaton has, I don't think is in line with his talent. No, same. I was just about to say, I feel like he is, and it sounds stupid saying it because he's Michael Keaton. It's I Michael feel like Keaton. he's an underrated actor because he, not only is he is he an amazing actor in films like this, he has a way of elevating what could be a not so great role. Like you think about him as the vulture in Spider-Man Homecoming. Think about the way that he plays it. It would be extremely forgettable if it wasn't him, but he he nailed that role. He he is what makes that role. Yeah, Vulture is not on my Michael Keaton Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I but that's what I'm saying. He has a way of elevating those roles that aren't that great. But in this film in particular, he's fantastic. Did you know that because obviously this is based on a book by Elmore Leonard, and it's actually a series. Of Indeed, books. this character will return. Yeah, played by Michael Keaton. Did you know that? I I I've known that for about forty eight hours. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, in answer to answer your question, yes, I did know that. Um, <laughs> to be honest, only because I looked at the IMDb for this film. Yeah, so, so that wasn't the, just there. I was like, when I watch Out of Sight, I'm not like, "Hey, fun fact." <laughs> Michael Keaton plays Nicolette in this film, so yeah, it was being produced at the same time, and they actually they held off the casting until they saw who Tarantino cast. Is that right? Yeah, and then he convinced the studio because it's a different studio. He convinced them not to charge them for the rights. He was like, "Come on, let them do it." <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is pretty cool, I think. <laughs> That's great. Can I tick off some bingo here? You can. I love the stakes in this film. Yes. Yep. The most the most at stake is $500,000, which is a lot of money, but it's not, let's just keep it with mid-90s De Niro. When they knock off the bank in heat, they want to get away with that with more than half a mil. We're talking about an amount of money that, is utterly life-changing for the characters we're talking about. And that is what makes it work, and that's why you care about her. They even go so far as to literally tell you her salary. <laughs> like, Yep. But it's not- With benefits. Yes, but it's not in an exposition-type way. It's just part of that character building where now you're with her and you care about her. Like, you understand her journey a little bit. I think it's fantastic. It's polar opposites to what happens in most comic book films- and I love it. Yeah. It's a little less realistic that that would be Ordell's. Um, got, like, he's literally talking about retiring on it. Like, this guy is is a gun runner, drug runner. Like, you would think that he would have maybe bigger ambitions. True. But as far as Jackie's concerned, yeah, you absolutely buy that that is a life-changing amount of money. Um, something I like about the way this film was shot 
And it, it ties into my feelings of the film that this film is at its best when it's just a hang. I think, though I have nothing to back this up with, I think there's a fairly consistent focal length used throughout the film. And it's quite a natural, in terms of the human eye and how we look at rooms. Yes. Yep. It's quite a natural human focal length. It's not It's not overly wide, but it's not massively zoomed in. And the way that Guillermo Navarro shoots the film is that when it is just people in a room and you are just hanging with these people in a room, the aperture is not wide open with only two millimetres. Yes. Of the, <laughs> of the image in focus. It allows you to just inhabit the space with them. But then if it's a scene where they really are drilling into character, like when um, after she has been picked up from the prison fairly early on in the film, they go to the bar. And that is that's really is then a real a character scene. That's where it's like, all right, we're going to have a shallow depth of field and we are just going to zero your attention in on the characters. Yeah. But most of the time, it just lets you hang out in the space and doesn't get too tied up with, look at how fancy and pretty I can make the image. And it's a great call on the cinematography front. I agree. I think the cinematography is beautiful and it really is great for the storytelling. And you think of early Tarantino, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, this was his third feature. I don't know about you, but you don't... I I think of him a little bit more like Kevin Smith, for example, where I think of him as a writer who just happens to direct rather than being a director. Certainly, I think now that's changed. He's got a lot of style now, but I think back then, that's certainly how I felt. But... I think you can really see him starting to develop some of those flourishes here. I think there are some really nicely directed scenes that marry well with the cinematography. Like you think about the scene where Ordell puts Beaumont in the trunk and drives away and you've got that one shot where you follow the car driving off, you hear the music go and the camera slowly pans up and over the fence and then you hear the music come back, you see the car and you hear the sounds of the doors and the gunshots. We don't need to get tied in on that. And in fact, it's more tense just having that one wide shot. And it gives you that continuous sense of time like this this is this is a plan. Like he's he's conducting this in 20 seconds. Like the time it took for this shot to happen, that's how long he drove around the block and killed this guy. <laughs> And I think it is such a smart directorial choice that adds a lot to that moment. Because so many people would, they, they'd give us that scene. Like, they'd give us dialogue there. They, it would, I just think it's so well done. Understatement is not something you think about when you think of, Car- of Tarantino. No, no. He's known for this mo- And that's why I was saying I think that a lot of people think of this movie maybe as the least Tarantino Tarantino. Because it doesn't have a lot of that stylized violence. It doesn't have as much of that kind of conversational humour. But I think that what he does marries so well with the material that's here that I think it works really, really well. I know that in the 90s we had to remember phone numbers a lot more than we do now, which is not at all. But <laughs> I still know my best friends from primary school's phone number. <laughs> I think I probably know mine as well. Yeah. Yeah, actually I do. Yep. Yeah. Um, but like, be okay, yeah, so that's that was a thing. But Ordell just knows Max's phone number. I yes, I did find that weird. I did find that weird when he when he did that. Yeah, call him bullshit on that one. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. He's only used unless see because I I read the book immediately after I listened to the book immediately after watching the movie. In the book, when he goes to 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 Max to bail out Beaumont, that's the first time he's met and dealt with Max. I can't remember if it's the same in the movie. It is, yeah. Yeah, so it's not like he has this big relationship with this guy. He's he's met him and used him twice. <laughs> he's not going to know his number by heart. Absolute garbage. <laughs> um, speaking of Max, we've like barely mentioned Foster. Oh, he's fantastic. Oscar nominated for the film. He's the only cast member that did get a nomination, which I haven't looked through who was nominated in every category this year, but there are other people that- you would think would have been in the conversation as well. This would have been Titanic year, would it not? I suppose you're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's where all the other nominations went. <laughs> well, not to Leo. <laughs> yeah. Good thing QT took him under his wing later on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like shouts to the recently departed Forster, who is, and sp- again, speaking of understatement. Yes. He plays Max Cherry j- uh, like to perfection. 
It's such a great character. The scene where he's talking about getting older and what he's done to his hair, that wasn't in the script. Really? Forster just said that to, to Tarantino because it's what he was doing. Yeah, right. Like he was, you know, he was getting older and struggling to get roles and <laughs> and he said, I'm fine with that being in a scene if you want. That's great. I, I love that. When a director is that open to letting the actors explore the characters, I think that does make for much more rich, fleshed out characters because that's when you get those real human moments that lend to the development of a character so much. And then again, like, you know, credit to Greer because- like we said, for the first half hour of the film, she's nigh on unsighted. And then by the end of the film, she really has just hijacked the entire thing and it's the Pam Greer show. Yes. And and you believe it from the start. The way she plays it as this completely confident, yet in some ways scared woman is so great. Like, she's so smart and, and witty and it's just so well played. Fun fact, this is the movie where Sam Jackson says motherfucker the most times. Really? It also must be the movie where he drops the N-bomb the most times, right? Well, yes, just ask Spike Lee. Yes, Spike Lee is not a happy man about this movie. No. No, he's not. I, I read about that just before watching it. And I must say, I was glad that from memory, Sam Jackson is the only person who says that word. That There's no utterances from, say, Quentin, who has been known to say it in film. Um, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's not for us to comment on. <laughs> no, I have nothing useful to say. No, nah. as a sheltered white boy. No, nah. all I'll say is that I, I, I like Spike Lee, and I know that he's a very passionate man. So if he's upset, I think he probably has a right to be. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say on it. <laughs> um, let's talk about the music, though. Sure. Great soundtrack. I put at least one song on a Spotify playlist as I was watching it. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's been in my head all week. Like it is, it is awesome. And it's cool because it, it's nice that the soundtrack for the film works as you kind of expect of this era Tarantino, which just works as a kick-ass soundtrack to the film. And then it takes the next step and actually they work in a bit of character development with it as well. Yep, that's what I love about it. Like, I reckon at least 50% of the time you hear songs in this film is from a character listening to the song. Like, at least 50%, probably more. So, yeah, it really does inform you about these people. So, how are you scoring this? I enjoy Jackie Brown. Um, The only reason I would seem lukewarm talking about the film is because, and this is not the film's fault, I can't help but judge it against, for instance, the film that came right before it in, in the guy's filmography, but I, look, I do dig the film. I'm a seven out of ten. Um, I'm an eight. I really, really, really loved this film. It, you're right. It's not as strong as of Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction for me, but it is very strong. And I do feel like it's a shame he hasn't done more adaptations because I feel like he could really, really nail one now. Like, it, this was great. So, yep, eight out of ten. It's recently become very trendy for this to be your favourite Tarantino film. Really? Yeah. I could I could see this becoming a favourite with a rewatch. Like I said, I, I feel like, I mean, I, I loved it enough. It made me go and read the book. And now that I know the story, I do think that a second viewing would probably knock it up to a nine. So I could see this definitely being people's favourites. Yeah, I can't because there's this film before it called Pulp Fiction. <laughs> so no. <laughs> All right. What are we getting to next week, buddy? Next week, uh, next stop on the patron train will be... A film that neither of us has seen, partly because neither of us like Michael Douglas. Yeah, yeah, I don't like Douglas. And partly because of that, um, I've never seen Basic Instinct. That's right, 90s erotic thriller, Basic Instinct. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it just because it's one of those films so it's many It's Basic people Instinct, talk about. yeah. Yeah. Like, how have you not seen it? That's right. Because Michael Douglas. I, I feel like I know. It's one of those movies that I feel like I know a lot about, but I, I'm very excited to finally watch it. So I guess we'll find out next week what we thought about it. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and then, of course, we've got another week of Patreon before we get on to what we've dubbed Septemberst. <laughs> Septemberster. <laughs> all 12 films in the Alien slash Predator franchise coming at you for all of September and half of October. And 
It's a trip. So that'll be fun. All right. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchthing.com or wewatchthing at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchthing. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchthing, and we will catch you next week. Be good. (laughs) 